forget to do that. So we are recording this um, because there's folks who couldn't be with us today. Um, let me just show you my screen and kind of give you an idea of what we're going to do here. Um, mostly it's going to be a conversation. Uh, share screen, there it is. So you should be able to see um, my screen, uh, which just has a, an opening slide on it. And then uh, here's our agenda. So I'm going to start us off with prayer in a moment. And I've got a couple of introductory remarks and some announcements. And then we're going to hear from five, four of our colleagues, just five minute presentations on what they're doing and how they're thinking about the fall. Um, each, these are four, they're all going to be very different uh, under the idea that you'll be able to take some, uh, some ideas from them. And then we'll spend the rest of the time um, I imagine that'll, that all of that will take us to about the halfway point, uh, about 1130, and then we'll just do a uh, general Q&A about uh, what we've heard, and then we'll wrap up and close by noon. So that's our plan for uh, today. A um, couple of announcements that I just wanted to call to your attention. We do have some ordinations coming up, which is very exciting. Um, three of them, Emily Casey has been called to serve as associate pastor at Bethesda in New Haven and uh, also principally at Yale University as a campus minister there for the, the university. So her ordination is going to be the afternoon of August 23rd. That's a Sunday. Victor Cabrera um, has been approved uh, through our candidacy committee and called to serve Iglesia Luterana, which is where he has been serving for a number of years. Um, and uh, <clears throat> sorry, distracted because somebody's calling me on my phone uh, from Union City, New Jersey. Um, and I don't know anybody there. Anyway, um, so Victor will be ordained on Saturday, August 29th, I think at one o'clock. And Andy Flat Kunzi has been called to Emmaus uh, in Falmouth, Maine. It'll be September 20th. All of those are going to be outdoors, um, socially distant, da, 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 all that kind of good stuff. So if there are pastors that are coming to that, you're welcome to come to any of these. However, we're not going to have the traditional laying on of hands of all of the clergy gathering. Uh, so, but, and nor will we have um, processions, but you are welcome to attend any of those either online um, or uh, in person. A second thing I just wanted to mention is you probably saw the um, email that went out. We've got these moving forward videos and worship, uh, which is still available. Um, if you have not used that and you want a Sunday off, that is a, a worship service that you can um, access and then uh, provide for your congregation. Um, and then lastly, not everybody knew her, but some of you did. Pastor Karen Sastrom died tragically and suddenly um, in this past um, summer and uh, or earlier in the summer, and we're going to have a memorial service for her at the congregation that she served, um, Christ the King and Epiphany. Lutheran Episcopal Churches in Wilbraham, Mass. Uh, Bishop Doug Fisher of the Western Mass Episcopal Diocese and I will be leading that memorial service on Saturday, September 19th. That also will be outdoors. So those were just some announcements I wanted you to know about. Can I, uh, can I jump in and just yeah. say, oh, go ahead. Um, the, the memorial service for Karen, um, there will be details coming and we're not sure yet how many people are going to be able to be there. So there may be a, a, a RSVP process for mm. that. And it will be live streamed so that those who can't attend in person um, can, can watch live. Good. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate that. Um, just before, so kind of to set the stage for the conversations we're going to have today, um, just thinking about being a bridge to the future, I think it's fair to say that, that we are in this uh, for the long haul and that anybody that tells you they know exactly how long this COVID-19 pandemic situation is going to last um, is probably making it up and pretending to be an expert. Um, but it's pretty clear to me that we are minimally for the rest of the calendar year of 2020 and likely 
into a year from now in some form of where we are now. That may of course change and most likely will not change all of a sudden, but would probably change gradually. Um, so a couple of thoughts about what to do in the meantime. Um, and I we just wanted to highlight these three things that I got from this article, <clears throat> which um, if you just go to freshexpressionsus.org, you'll be able to find this article, which is called Churches Who Survive the Pandemic Will Do Three Things. And that article talks about three items, distributed leadership, digital platform, and serving the neighborhood. Um, and I think in many ways, these are continuations of things we've been talking about here in New England for a while. Um, and it, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is more of an accelerant on everything in our lives uh, than any one particular change. Uh, I think it's just speeding things up. Um, so think about what does distributed leadership mean? In other words, if you as the pastor or deacon serving a congregation or a campus ministry setting, are the only one and you're doing everything from the bulletin to preaching um, for worship service, that model is going to disappear. And I would encourage you to try to get out in front of that. I think a way forward is um, what John Polk uh, introduced to many of us with his shepherding groups, um, having those in place. I know many of you already do, which I think is excellent. Um, and then kind of developing a network of people that are connecting with other people. The second thing is a digital platform. And I don't just mean like broadcasting your worship service on Facebook or YouTube or whatever you're doing, although that's part of it. How are you going to be present digitally? It, is it worthwhile for your congregation to have a podcast as one example? I think so. For instance, you could just do 10, 15 minute interviews um, and put them on a podcast. Those interviews could be with members of your congregation and put them on a podcast and release one once a week of just getting to know other people in the congregation. Think of five questions and you could just ask the same five questions to each person and people could learn about each other. So that's just one suggestion, but I think thinking about a digital platform for your congregation is important uh, and all of the different pieces. And the, and the last one is really a continuation of what at least I've been talking about for decades, um, but uh, principally in the last eight years for all of us in New England is how are we serving the neighborhood? How are we serving the communities that we're in? Because that's, um, we, we continue to be better off when we're outward focused as opposed to inward focus. And my one concern with this pandemic among many, but I guess the chief one is that we could this could be a time where we just turn inward even more so. And I, I think that that is highly problematic for the future of our congregations. So those are my thoughts. I would encourage you to go to that article and um, maybe, you know, let's see, I could probably, uh, well, I'll probably paste that into the chat box when we get out of this. All right, so that was just kind of by way of introduction. Um, what I'm gonna do now is we've got um, some guest presenters. And um, this is how we're gonna, uh, we're gonna let them present and I'll switch out of this mode here and then we'll do the discussion afterwards. So these are the four people um, we're gonna hear from. Anna Tu is gonna go first, John Longworth second, Kathy Roars third, Dwayne Peterson fourth. Um, let me get out of this. And we can start with Anna. And if you folks want to see her beautiful, lovely face, you can just switch from speaker view to gallery view. And when she starts talking, she'll appear. So Anna, I assume you're with us. I'm with us. I mean, I'm with you. Uh, <laughs> hi, everybody. Um, so a few things I kind of want to start out with by way of kind of prefacing things is um, if the pandemic has taught me anything, it's that I can't predict the future. Um, so I no longer try. Uh, the, the good news about our saviors is that we were already quite good at pant seat aviation, uh, flying by the seat of our pants. Um, and so we always have plans, but we're always flexible and we don't kind of make declarations. We also try very hard to monitor the participation in things. 
so that we're not just like throwing things into the ether that aren't getting picked up and having a lot of motion without a lot of progress. Um, and trying to keep in mind too that church isn't the only or even the primary priority in people's lives. So we're trying to be helpful, um, but kind of not take up too much airspace. Um, and uh, in terms of distributed leadership, I think that's a fantastic point. Um, we have also been following the model of getting everybody called in our directory. We did that at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we had council members in charge of calling different groups. Um, those groups are continuing with the folks that want continued contact and that's developed some new relationships. Um, and they now check in at least uh, once a week with those who still want to. Um, and that's been absolutely fantastic. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. And it's also helped me to kind of stay in the discipline of taking time off and, and paying attention to my own health, which I do think takes, uh, takes some discipline. Um, the, uh, when we talked about our values in Forward, the first thing that came up was uh, being sacramental and, and being about worship. Um, so we um, concentrated first on online worship, and then uh, now we're holding outdoor services. Um, and if anybody has any questions, you're thinking about doing an outdoor service, um, you can find my email, um, contact me. I, I'm not an expert, but we've been doing it now for uh, about a month and a half and it's, it's been pretty good. Um, so that's been good. Um, we're also doing a, a remote kids minute um, called I Just Wanna Know. I have a guy who's a, a puppeteer and a former clown and uh, his name is Dan. Some of you know him, he used to work for Lego. Uh, by the way, Bishop, he says hi. He called me right before this. Um, and uh, so we've been asking kids to submit questions for me to start with. Um, and I've been kind of picking through and answering them and, and our kids have had great questions. Um, with a puppet named Elmer. So I've been doing that once a week and that's been really fun. Um, and we've gotten some views on that, it's been great. Um, but we called it, I just wanna know, so that when the kids run out of questions for me, um, we can have other guests on. Uh, Cause we have a lot of people in our congregation with super cool jobs. Um, and I, I think that'll be fun for, for kids too. Um, and then we also, you know, we didn't call it kids just want to know so that, you know, if, if perchance an adult has a question, um, they could also ask. Um, so that's what we're doing for kids. Um, adult wise, uh, the Sunday after Labor Day, we're starting a, a Zoom book study on uh, I'm Still Here, um, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. Um, super good book. I read it in 2018 when it came out. It's, it's gotten some uh, extra airplay in these times. Um, so we're going to kind of pick through that. I think it's an especially good selection because it kind of breaks down the whole idea of wanting to be a good white person. And, and she kind of calls out those of us who imagine ourselves to be good white people and the ways that we get in the way of our siblings of color. So um, that's, uh, that's our adult ed piece. And that'll be on Sundays uh, via Zoom. Um, and finally, uh, completely grassroots, uh, a prayer shawl ministry just started growing in our garden. Um, we have a lot of people who knit. Um, and so these uh, about five women, uh, so far it's all women, um, they're meeting via Zoom, they're making prayer shawls, they're turning out prayer shawls at an alarming rate. Um, and we have those available at our outdoor services. Um, if anybody wants to just take one um, and give it to somebody who they feel like uh, needs love um, right now and, and needs kind of a hug from God. But that's that's sort of what we're doing. Um, but if, if any of those things fall off in terms of participation, then we'll rethink it. Um, and if infection rates go up, we'll rethink the outdoor service. Um, if they go way down, um, we'll kind of think about going indoors. Uh, I'm not ready to go indoors right now. And again, not trying to predict the future, but uh, that's where we are. We're flying by the seat of our pants and uh, occasionally we even get some altitude. And so that's all I got. All right, Anna, thank you very much. Just um, could you tell us the name of the book by Austin Channing Brown again? Oh, there we go. It's called I'm Still Here. Um, I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. Great, okay. Um, so if you folks have questions um, for Anna, uh, we can do this in a couple of, what I would encourage you to do is to make a note to yourself in whatever way is gonna work for you to make that note. If you want to type it into the chat box, you can do that. 
Um, and when we get through all of the presentations, then I'll come back and uh, you know we can go through them each uh, one at a time. All right, next up is John Longworth. So John, welcome. Good morning. Uh, welcome from Vermont. You may have uh, remembered us from the end of I Am Legend as the only place where the zombies weren't, um, <laughs> which is kind of how we feel now. <laughs> um, we just went through a 43-day stretch with not a single COVID death. Uh, and so I I'm, I'm, want to preface all of my remarks with saying that I understand that our circumstances on the ground are different than the ones just elsewhere in our region, and certainly very different than other places in the country. Um, but what we're planning for the, the fall, uh, we were really fortunate that uh, last year we were able to secure a number of grants for doing some major construction inside our building. And uh, I was uh, really excited that even with the brief shutdown, we were able to complete all of the construction inside our building. So we have three brand new classrooms inside our existing footprint, a brand new dining room. Um, things are really refreshed which is great because one of the things that we need to be able to do this, uh, this fall is provide a space for children who are opting for the remote instruction um, that the public schools are offering. Uh, the school districts here are doing all sorts of different things, hybrid programs, half-day programs, um, part virtual, part in person. It's, it's a real mishmash. So we're gonna host with a licensed teacher, uh, a Zoom Academy room, uh, in one of our new spaces that will allow grade school children to come be supervised by an assistant and a licensed teacher and do their remote learning while their parents go to work. Uh, one of our major employers here in our community is the health center. And so we've got parents that don't have a choice about whether or not they can be at work, um, but they also want to make sure that all their kids are in the same safe space. Um, so that's one thing that we're planning for this fall. Uh, related to that, I in my time here have been doing chapel with all of our preschool and grade school children. And uh, just like regular adult worship, chapel worship is seriously um, restricted uh, by COVID. And so I'm beginning the process of putting together a video series with my friend here, Ezekiel. Uh, and we're gonna be reading from the Spark Bible. And I'm probably gonna try to do some videos where I can capture the really beautiful illustrations that are in that book. Um, and I want to work off of, um, uh, Mr. Rogers is probably the more familiar example, but here in Vermont, we have a new uh, performer, Mr. Chris, um, who is uh, very much in that same vein, very quiet, very reflective, very joyful. Um, and so I want to try to put together some uh, video experiences for the children who are in care so that they can stay in their group of bubbles rather than gathering together as a whole center. Uh, and be able to do chapel type experiences in whatever classroom that they're in. Uh, and so I'm gonna try to do as much as I can in terms of um, getting set pieces committed to video clips so that then I can then clip them together to make new episodes um, for each week. Um, along the same line of videos, we're doing a lot of repurposing. So this is actually our old video camera that we bought several years ago. It was not created with the internet in mind, uh, but thanks to some folks in other parts of the country, I've gotten connected to a number of online worship groups. If you're not part of the Facebook group called Zoom Worship, search for it, join it. There's no, it's a public group. There's no special requirements to join. Uh, they are full of suggestions on how we can do things like take that old camera and turn it into a webcam for our sanctuary so that we can get HD camera without having to buy more equipment. Um, there's all kinds of old tricks you can use in terms of repurposing um, uh, cables, connectors, old cameras, uh, as long as they're not too old. The last thing that we're planning for um, is trying to figure out how we're going to sustain our carryout operations. Um, when everything went into shutdown mode in March, we turned a sit-down community center and a sit-down dinner both into carryouts. Um, and during lockdown, we fed, uh, we put out almost 3,000 meals um, just during the lockdown. Um, that pace has slowed a little bit, um, but we're trying to figure out how to make sure that we have enough supplies and enough um, materials that we can keep that going because we're still seeing anywhere from 30 to 40 guests daily for food. Um, and uh, being able to pass out the food is one of the few ways we can do that. 
When it comes to distributed leadership, uh, one of the things we've been doing is working with all the folks who work in our direct service ministries and coaching them on how to have three minute pastoral care conversations, because that's how much time we get with people now is about three minutes. Um, how are you? Are you well? How, you know, how, how is it, how is it going with you emotionally, spiritually? Are you housed? Um, we've been trying to help people understand that those brief interactions are opportunities for, not for them to refer someone to the pastor, but for them to be pastoral caregivers in that space. Um, along the same lines, um, really grateful for the New England Synod School of Lay Ministry because thanks to the, um, their efforts, we now have several lay evangelists that we've trained here. Uh, so I'm gonna take all my vacation this year. And several of those weekends are gonna be covered by um, uh, lay members of our congregation who have been coached in leading worship and in preaching. And I'm super, super grateful for their efforts. Um, the last thing I'll say is that we've been worshiping outside for about seven weeks now. Um, been outside for almost all of it. Um, and because of the low case rate, because of the low transmission, we're having serious conversation about moving to indoor worship in mid-October, um, when it will really become, the weather won't be good for meeting outside here. Uh, we have figured out a, a map for our sanctuary that uses all of the available space to get us right up to the state requirement of 25% capacity nobody more, um, and we're developing a sign-up system uh, on our main office so that people can reserve spots for worship. Because once there's a hard cap in numbers, there has to be a sign-up process so that we don't go over the numbers. So that's what we're working on for the fall. Great, thanks, John. Um, two things, quickly, could you mention that, that uh, Facebook Zoom Academy, whatever that was? Uh, so the, the Facebook group is just called Zoom Worship. If you, if you search for Zoom worship in the Facebook search box, you'll find it, it's a group. And it's people who are smarter than me when it comes to cameras and technology, giving tons of amazing advice on how to capture worship, how to make great videos, how to make great Zoom meetings, all of that. Mm. Um, immensely helpful. Great, and then the second thing is, in terms of worship moving towards the indoor possibility in the fall, if you exceed the capacity, does that mean you anticipate having more than one worship service or is it just gonna be first come first serve and the highest offering envelope gets to come first? So uh, <laughs> during our time of outdoor worship, we've been having a single worship service because of the whole drag everything onto the lawn thing, <laughs> which makes a lot of work. Um, and once we move back inside, we'll probably restore our Saturday night service, which will make our weekend cap 90 people, provided that only 45 people go to each Got service. Okay. And that should give us enough flexibility to accommodate for visitors. We've also built in to our registration idea, we've counted for all of the worship leaders in that head count, as well as leaving two slots unreserved so that two couples, two families could show up unannounced and still get seating, hmm. um, which is about as many guests as we've ever gotten on a given weekend is, is two, to, two to three guests. Got it. Perfect. Great. Thanks very much. All right. So again, if you have questions for John, you can put them in the chat box uh, and or, or we'll come back to them uh, after we're done. So Kathy Roars, Kathy's pastor in Middletown, Connecticut. Kathy? Hi. Yeah, I have um, four quick things. Um, the first one is probably my longest one. I'm planning to do, uh, I'm, trying, I'm planning to play to my strengths. So um, people like it when I tell stories and sermons and um, uh, in confirmation, they like it when I just tell the stories rather than have us read them. So I thought, why not do Bible stories on YouTube? I can uh, create a YouTube channel. I can uh, link it to our website and our Facebook page and um, just tell Bible stories. I've got about a hundred of them. So if I drop one a week, it's about a two-year project. If I do two, two a week, it's about a one-year project. Um, let's see. I'm going to get a thriving grant. I'm going to, going to apply for a thriving grant. Chris Diane suggested this, that it was a great idea. I need a tripod for my phone. Uh, so that'll be part of it. And then we video has a YouTube, uh, editor, um, service where you can get uh they have over a million pictures and video clips 
that you can have license to, uh, to use. Uh, they do music as well. Um, and that costs for a subscription that's uh, about $218 a year. Um, so that'll take up the whole Thrivent Grant, those two things. I'm still working on a title for it. I think it's Bible, Studies for, Bible Stories for Everyone, but something sort of like that. Um, the second thing is, um, another thing I like to do is write prayers. So another way that I've been trying to stay in contact with my congregation is I write prayers on Facebook. And uh, I try to post one a day. Um, yesterday I had no power because of the storm that went through. But I try to do it every day. Um, I've gotten a lot of feedback on that. Um, sometimes I, I post them on the church Facebook page sometimes. Um, sometimes they're a little too personal for that, so I just do it on my own. Um, number three, uh, we do Zoom in our building. Um, we're a little different. Vermont, I'm, I'm shocked that Vermont had no deaths from COVID yet. Um, in 16 weeks here in Connecticut, within one hour of me, we lost 4,300 people. So we don't want to even meet outside yet where we are. Uh, so we're still inside and we're, um, we're live worship and Zoom. And I have a green screen behind me at home and I took a picture of the sanctuary. So I put it on the green screen. So whenever I'm worshiping on Zoom, I got, it looks like I'm at church, the background. Um, makes people feel a little bit better, I think, you know, being able to see the church. Um, let's see. And number five, my last one I'll mention today, um, thanks to Dick Burgess, gave me this idea, but on the auto signature on my um, email that goes out, I've put down how to join us for worship so that every time, you know, I email somebody in the congregation, that information is there just so it's like um, at people's fingertips. So that's what I have. Great. Thanks so much, Kathy. Appreciate that. And yes, the context is very different where we are in terms of what's going on um, or Connecticut versus uh, Vermont. Those are probably the two extremes. All right, appreciate that very much. Uh, Dwayne Peterson is St. John in Stamford, so even closer to uh, the hotspot of, of, or what was the hotspot in New York City. So, Dwayne? I saw him earlier. There, I yeah. needed to unmute. Yeah, uh, we are actually, I think, the, the southernmost congregation in uh, the Synod, and we are actually a bedroom community in New York City, so very much. Uh, the harshness of COVID has given shape to us. Like many of you have been doing online worship since mid-March, we have been taping, editing, and then posting on YouTube, which has given us a very good high quality video. We're actually being watched by about 20 other congregations who don't have the technical resources to do online worship. So we found a little sub ministry without even intending it. Uh, but in terms of human resources, we can't sustain all of the pre-recording and editing over the long haul once we return to the sanctuary. We just won't have the, the oomph to do it. And so we are in the process of installing two cameras in the sanctuary for live streaming. Uh, we've contracted with a service that will run both of the cameras remotely, so I don't have to recruit, train, and schedule volunteers. So it should be a uh, pretty slick operation. We held one outdoor worship in July, uh, social distance on the grass and in cars using FM transmitter. We'll hold another one August 23rd. And then my leadership is comfortable with trying starting September 13th to begin indoor worship, but we will be prepared to close down again in a heartbeat uh, if the numbers dictate that that's what we should do. Obviously following all the CDC guidelines that all of you are already well familiar with. I do anticipate nearly everything except worship to be done via, via Zoom uh, this fall. Uh, so that includes adult classes, Bible studies, confirmation instruction, Sunday school, all of our committee meetings, virtual coffee hour, different fellowship groups that we have, care groups, youth group, everything. That's what I think our life is going to look like at least at the end of 2020. And I agree with you, Bishop, uh, probably for longer. Um, because we're doing so much online, uh, we're making plans to partner on a number of things, especially in education with uh, the ecumenical and interfaith community here in Stamford. 
Um, I think it's kind of foolish for all of us to be creating this online stuff just for our own congregations. So this is a wonderful opportunity to collaborate. The exception of uh, not meeting together will be our music program. Our, our choir is going to transition into two handbell choirs. They already read music. Um, it keeps them engaged and bells don't spread the virus much. So that's what we're doing with our choirs. Um, we'll be designing uh, some kind of special online viewing for All Saints, Confirmation Sunday, since we missed that last spring. Santa Lucia, which is uh, a nod to our Swedish background that we do each year, and probably the Sunday School Christmas program. So we'll be working on all of that uh, very soon. I've got three funerals on standby. No idea when families will be ready to, to actually hold something in the sanctuary. Uh, that'll depend on their comfort level and, and our willingness by way of safety. Social ministry and that third uh, point, engaging the community has been the most difficult for us. We've been hyper cautious about encouraging our members to gather in person, frankly, for anything, much less mission work because most of the mission activity that this congregation has engaged is, has been in, uh, intentionally hands-on. So we've had to rethink everything. Those groups that we partner with have had to give us a lot of guidance as to how we can be helpful. We've done food drives. Um, when we can't do something uh, hands-on that we're accustomed to doing, cash contributions for special needs uh, truly have been outstanding. I just put out the word and the money just pours in. I'm surprised and pleased. Um, and we're going to begin an anti-racism program that is Stanford-wide, done jointly with the interfaith community, uh, the public schools, the police department, the city government, and the social service agencies. So that'll be kind of a, uh, a big deal, I think, for, for the entire city and for our church. We're gonna meet soon to imagine what our fall stewardship program might look like. Um, I've got a past program that utilizes wordles that some pastors in uh, Wisconsin are stealing from me, and I'd be happy to share that with you if you don't have something in mind for the fall. Um, and I'd welcome any ideas that anyone has that is, has already started working on fall stewardship. And lastly, I know of a number of our members who've lost their jobs, so I'll be reaching out to them to see if, if there's specific ways our congregation can support them um, and that make sure they're connected with the resources that they need. Um, amazingly, our congregational offerings have been right where we thought they would be without the pandemic, gratified and thankful. Uh, we're getting killed, however, with our rental income. Uh, we have seven congregations worshiping in our building and they haven't returned yet. Um, however, we've also got a bunch of savings, primarily through property, and we've done enough that we've kind of, it's sort of a wa wash, and so we're, at this point, pretty stable financially. My five minutes are more than up. <laughs> Thanks, Dwayne. Real quick question on that rental. I know one of the rentals is the college. Um, yeah. it, uh, it, that's probably dependent on what they're going to do also. We, we host a music conservatory by Concordia College in Bronxville. Uh, uh, that, that's actually LCMS, so it's interesting we have that arrangement. Um, they, they are going to start uh, music lessons in the various studios within our building, but they're practicing strict, I mean very strict uh, guidelines, and that affects us because once renters come into the building, our other renters they're not allowed to wander about the building like they too often do. So we've got those kind of logistic issues, as well as we renegotiated contracts with them, uh, indicating that they will in fact abide by the guidelines, that they are confined to the space, that they are rent renting, those sorts of things, or literally we will uh, fine them uh, for the disinfecting that may be required, that sort of thing. So we've been kind of hard asked about, I mean, right up front, uh, about how this is going to work if we're going to be able to do that together. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Thanks very much. All right. So um, now we'll spend some time um, in just general q and I'm going to start by uh, just going back to the chat box to kind of see if there's any questions. Um, it looks like uh, Wendy Anderson asked a question of Anna about streaming and Anna answered that in terms of how they're doing that both on YouTube and on Facebook. 
Um, uh, Mary Hanson Joyce likes the Zoom Academy. Uh, Pastor Kim had a question for John. Uh, specifically, I'll read it because I didn't see an answer here. And I believe this is Kim from New Hampshire. We've been talking about this, but running into insurance liability issues in parallel with our preschool. Did you run into any of those? So let's just start, John. It was directed to you, John Longworth. Did any uh, insurance liability discussions around that particular question? So one of the things that really helps us is that the, um, the Zoom Academy is going to be run under our current early childhood license, which actually goes all the way up to, I don't know, third or fourth grade in the state of Vermont. Um, and so all of the relevant insurance that we have for our center will apply to this classroom as well. The teacher, the, the registered or the licensed teacher is an employee of our center. You know, so all of this stuff all just automatically falls under our current umbrella policy, which, um, you know, is like a $3 million aggregate policy. So um, it's not a small, <laughs> it's not a small uh, insurance policy that we carry. Um, so we've, we've, in communication with our provider, um, they feel like it, if, as long as it's all falling under the, um, the auspices of our existing license with the state, they're, they're fine to uh, roll the coverage, you know, the coverage will include that as well. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kim, I think it's Kim Hester who's asking that question. I'd be, I encourage you to be in touch with John if you have more specific questions or if you want to talk with me about those. Um, and Kari just provided a clarification. She's not losing her job um, that, uh, to Emily. Um, so Kathy Roars, for, from whom did you get grants for the church? Not clear as to what that's about. Um, I think that might be about our construction grants. Uh, go ahead. Um, so the state of Vermont um, is woefully under-equipped for childcare and for early childhood education. And so in that sense, we're fortunate because there's a lot of grant programs through the state that are designed to increase the capacity of those programs. And so it was the uh, Building Bright Futures Fund that we got those dollars from, um, which paid entirely for all of the construction. Uh, it's the easiest congregational meeting I've ever been a part of where we could say that neither the school nor the church would spend any money, but when we were done, we would have $75,000 worth of upgrades. Great. So that is encouragement for those of you that have preschools, check with your state. Uh, that may or may not be an option. Obviously, that's a unique to Vermont thing. Uh, Jonathan has a question. What are people doing for confirmation, youth group, and first communion? And then I see a Joe Grauman. Um, Joe, you want to take a minute and just kind of elaborate on your response on planning for Zoom confirmation and weekly sure. youth group? Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> confirmation, at least this past year, before uh, COVID slapped us across the face, um, was difficult in trying to get everyone's schedules synchronized. Some people were just broadly unavailable Monday through Friday. Other people had fencing lessons at midnight, you know, those kinds of things. And um, the COVID uh, crisis was a good opportunity. We moved to a weekly confirmation um, just, just to like before everyone's schedules hardened up again. And the plan is to do just confirmation over Zoom the same way um, really simple, right? Going through the book, kind of the same tools we would use uh, as far as, um, you know, if, if we were in person, um, opportunities for discussion. Uh, regarding youth group, one thing that I found was super, super easy uh, was gathering kids just for online games. Um, we would do Pictionary. Uh, there's a bunch of online word generators available online and you can throw up the whiteboard on Zoom and anyone can edit it. And it took absolutely no, like, no planning, no forethought, and kids could just hang out with each other. And for some it might be Zoom fatigue, for other kids it was like a chance to just kind of unwind from their online classes. I don't know if that's still going to be the vibe going forward, right, um, in, in kind of the new, new uh, classroom setting. Uh, it took absolutely um, no planning and it was a weekly source of 
joy for both me and the kids. Uh, there's also a website and I'll send it in the chat. It's called sketchful.io. And if you don't want to go the whiteboard route, you can have the kids on Zoom and then have kids log on to this um, website. It's ad based, so it's like a little like crunchy, but the ads are fine. It's for children. And it basically runs the Pictionary game for you with timers and, and all of that. Um, and we would do that every week and it was a lot of fun. And it, like I said, super easy. All right, great. Thank you, Joseph. That's really helpful, yeah. And uh, let's go on. Jonathan, part of a handbell choir that hasn't started practicing. My director sent out this document for some guidance for safe ringing. So you can check out that, that's in the chat. Um, Kim says, we will be unveiling a new twist on our intergenerational faith formation, which prior to pandemic was called CTK Grows. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, think monthly thematic. So there's basically some ideas there. You can look at that uh, suggestion. Uh, Jonathan, if you are going back to in-person worship, in-building worship, are you making people sign a liability waiver? Um, I think that that's probably a question that I would ask an attorney or your insurance carrier as to whether or not that is required. Um, and since Jonathan, you're in New Hampshire, I'd reach out to Brad Cook on that one for uh, just clarification. One of the things I have learned about signing of liability waivers is their holding up and standing in court is really quite uh, varied and often inadequate. Um, uh, it's, it, because if the plaintiff can prove that you were negligent, i.e., say, willfully denying uh, CDC guidelines, then that kind of liability goes to the back water. So I would check with insurance or with an attorney. Um, so Dwayne answered that, how he's doing that. Um, Brett is sending love notes to Joseph. Uh, people, okay. So then there's some more information on the waiver and then there's that link, okay. People having to go, all right. So, um, John Longworth, how are you doing sign up for the in-person worship? Is there a platform you're using? Um, we're using Sign Up Genius and, sign up Genius. Um, and the um, kind of the uh, office administrator is a captain for that just because we know that whatever tool we put out there, there will be the person who will call and say, I don't do computers. I don't know how to read. I don't want to learn. Don't make me do hard things. Sign me up for church next Sunday. <laughs> so, right. so that the, the, the phone and the email and the office are, are sort of the, the perpetual backup for just about everything. Okay. Hope that's helpful. Um, and Mark Huber has got a link in there, reopen.church. Um, that could be a resource. Barbara's asking for in-person worship. Are we required to do aerosol cleaning? So, um, again, we've all become mini doctors. Uh, first answer is always check with your state requirements. Um, and if this is Barbara at St. Peter's in Newport, that would be in Rhode Island. I will say that uh, one of the podcasts I listened to is Michael Osterholm. He was also a guest presenter for um, bishops and folks in Minnesota. And he thinks the congregation's are are spending too much time, energy, and maybe money on worrying about things like cleaning surfaces because this has become more and more, we're learning it's airborne. I don't know what aerosol cleaning would look like. That almost sounds like sanitation, and there's a difference between cleaning and having a professional sanitizing group come in. So I would, I would refer you back to state guidelines on that. Uh, event bright are people struggling with the care teams I'm not sure they're working in my congregation I yeah I've heard that too they like in some congregations they're working really well in other congregations they're not working so well which is you know just kind of the unique character of our congregations before we go on to Mark's uh, question anybody want to chime in on uh, how maybe anybody that had struggles with the care team that then found some ways 
forward the care teams or shepherding groups or things like that. Um, anybody want to comment on that? I'll just let you open your microphone on your own and, and, and answer your thoughts on that. Hearing none, that either means it's not working in any of our congregations or everybody's got it all figured out. I'll say something. Okay. Um, Who is this first? This is Erica Kennedy. Thank you. I have my boss because my internet is better this way. Um, but I have found that our callers or our connectors, um, a few of them, while it worked for them at first, it um, they have gotten tired or they're revisiting my connectors to see if they needed to opt out. So I've had to change out some people um, and that has helped. Um, we've also, um, I've worked with each one of them. Some people prefer email over phone calls. Um, some people we prefer once a week, some like every other. So we've had to just, um, do a little more a la carte kind of options. And so I've worked with my connectors to figure out what works for them and for the people they're connecting with. So it's what worked at first hasn't continued to work, but with modifications, it's working well. Well, and I think you've just hit on what Anna was saying at the beginning, which is that we are constantly in motion here. And what, when, what worked three months ago is now, you know, that's like the 1970s at this point. So, um, but that, I think that's really helpful. Your connectors, as you're calling them in your congregation, um, are probably key. There might even be some fatigue, um, which would be perfectly understandable uh, there. Can um, I ask a question about yeah, that? Yeah, please go ahead. I'm curious for people for whom that's working well. This is Heidi Johnston in Quincy, Massachusetts. Uh, what kind of training seems a little overboard, but what kind of guidance are you giving people who are making calls? Because I just, I'm getting, um, I even like our people on our council, they feel either they're like, they feel they're way too busy or they don't feel comfortable calling people. Um, they don't know what, you know. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going back to John a lot because I've heard him coach people with three questions um, that for, and I believe that was for your meal hunger ministry. Could you repeat those three questions? Because I do think one of the things that can be helpful in these situations is to give people not so much a script, but like here are three questions to ask. And also with the caveat, as we all know as pastors, sometimes you interact with people and it just goes nowhere for five conversations, but then the sixth one is when they unload because that's the nature of how these things go. John, could you repeat those three questions you had people ask? Um, the three questions for our, for our rapid pastoral care are uh, just a very general, how, how are you this week? So try to get people grounded in where they are right now so you're not hearing stories from a gazillion years ago. Question number two is, um, you know, how, how is your spirit or how are you feeling? Try, try to get people to use some feeling words or some, some spirit words um, because that might give you different information than hearing about Zooming with their grandchildren last week. And then the last question we always ask everybody is where are you staying? Because most of the people we work with don't live in one place all of the time. And so where are you staying is really important because it tips us off about do we need to provide a lot of extra care? Um, that third question might not be terribly relevant for folks that are effectively homebound. A variation on that might be that third question is how can we at St. John's by the gas station be of help? Uh, very broad, but and most people might say, "Oh, nothing. I'm fine." But uh, again, um, maybe the fifth or sixth time you ask that question, you might find out actually somebody lost their job, but they haven't wanted to talk about that lately. So, um, could I ask right. for one more thing? Um, one more, and then we'll go on to the next question. So, yeah, please introduce yourself because it's hard to figure out. I'm looking at seventy people. Erica Kennedy. Uh, okay. uh, so every week, actually every Thursday, I send an email out to my connectors. I call them connectors now because 
some call, some email, um, some text, you know, whatever way works. Um, and so every Thursday afternoon, I send an, an email out to those folks and thank them for what they're doing. And also I, I do some bullet points about here are some things you might mention in your call. And if that's something that is coming up at the church or something we're doing differently, or maybe listen for folks that are unemployed or how is unemployment changing for them because it was the end of July. And so I just give them like a couple points to think about or something to consider. At the same time, I also include a, a new prayer each week and suggest that if they're leaving a message, then in the message, they could leave the prayer. And I think that's been really well received. Um, and it also gives them something to say if they're wondering, what do I say when I leave the message? So those are a couple things that are working for us as mm. we continue to work on the fly. Wow, those are really helpful, Erica. Thank you. I like that prayer idea too. Um, go ahead and leave it on the voicemail, whether they're there or not. For Lutherans, that's like safe praying with other people. You know, you can just leave a message and then hang up. Uh, all right. And, I hope that was helpful. And people are really appreciating it. They may not call back every week, but we're finding that they're getting the prayers. And um, so uh, God's working through that stuff. All right. Super. Um, I think that Anna provided some suggestions from Massachusetts on the aerosol question. Uh, Eric uh, talks about creating a task force. Um, with information from Maine. Uh, Elizabeth, we have used pairs since the beginning. So people were paired to another person. And then in our weekly e-news, I send two questions that people can use for conversation. So that's similar to what Erica just suggested. That's a good idea. Um, all right. Uh, maybe in, in yeah, transition to pairs. Uh, Ross, in one round, we suggested to start check-ins to ask people what they are looking forward to. Um, people might uh, weary of how are you. All right. So those are some uh, different uh, ideas. on. We could probably start a Facebook uh, group of questions to ask. So, but basically what I'm hearing from this is that people need prompts. They, you know, not a script, but they like, here are some things you can ask and talk about. Um, I think for many of us as pastors, we're kind of used to on the fly engaging, but maybe for lay people, this is new and isn't going to come naturally. So if you can give them some suggestions. Um, all right. So a couple of people are, are by, down, by, down, sorry, bowing out. And I just read Hughes dying, and battery dying. And I said dying out. So hopefully you're not dying out on this. Um, so we're coming up with, uh, couple minutes to go. Anybody else have any other questions or thoughts? I guess one of the questions that I did have for all of you is, is this helpful? Would you like us to convene this on a monthly basis uh, going forward? Um, how did this format work in terms of having some of you do the presenting of what you're doing? I think this was great for me. I don't know if once a month, this is Heidi Johnston, Faith Lutheran Quincy. I don't know if I'd be ready to do this again in a month because time is feeling very bizarre right now to me, um, but maybe like every two months or something. I don't know. Um, I'm very curious and I'll reach out to some folks about just one more question. I'm sorry. I know we're almost done, but about transition, like we're trying to figure out how to transition from me sitting in front of my computer doing a Zoom service to then maybe live, live streaming uh, in our sanctuary, which would be a completely different ball game um, and trying to get that like higher high quality sound. So I'm, if, if people want to send me a message, if you're feeling like you feel confident about that, I'd love to talk with you. Okay. All right. Um, one of the things in terms of connecting with one another, there is a directory on the Synod website um, so that you can go there and download that gets updated. That directory gets updated once a month. It's going to become password protected if it's not already, just because we think part of the reason you are receiving these 
scams of, you know, the bishop needs iTunes card because he's, you know, stranded in Norway um, kind of thing is that's one possibility of where that's coming from. So it's already password protected. Remind us of the password now since uh, I think it's NE Synod or yeah, NE Synod. If you go, so if you want to contact one another and you need that directory, um, it's on the Win Synod website. Um, and the password for those PDFs is NE Synod. All right. Um, so, okay. So, the general, so uh, what I would suggest is if you have ideas for, uh, and again, everything moves so quickly, we're not going to decide now what we'll talk about next time. I think we wait till we get a little closer. But I'm glad this is helpful. Keep talking with one another. This will be recorded. So, colleagues that ask you about it, or if you need a refresher, you can go back and watch it. Also, we will then download the whole chat uh, as a document and get that out to everybody because there were links in making that all available to everyone. All right, anything else? Anybody wanna chime in here? I know some people have to go. All right, sounds like it's good to leave on that note. Thank you so much for what you're doing. I'm really impressed with your agility. Um, and I know this is not easy. I know it's tiring. Um, please reach out to either myself or associates for things that you need. Um, I do know that one of the questions uh, particularly that I have become aware of is what it is like to be a pastor when you have young children, elementary school children at home. That that particular challenge, that's something that um, I and, and other bishops are hearing about other parts of the country as to how to navigate that. And having just spent two weeks with my grandchildren, I, I know what that's like a little bit now with a three-year-old. And Miriam's holding up what, uh, is that your grandson or daughter? I can't quite tell. So um, we're all kind of chipping in with one another. So thank you all for what you're doing. Really appreciate it. Why don't we um, close with a word of prayer. Lord be with you. Good and holy God, we give you thanks for this time together because the only way we are strong or stronger is through you and the way you connect us with one another. Clearly, we learn from one another as we're all trying to figure out how we do ministry in these times. We rest in the knowledge and hope of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit which continues to work through us in these days. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. God bless everyone. Be well. Take care. Thanks again for the four presenters. Appreciate your doing that for us today. You too. Be well.